I'll start by introducing you first. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the first of our webinar, summer webinars of the GC webinar series, The Aftermath of COVID-19, The New Social Impact Ecosystem. Today, we're very honored to have with us Sampiti Ganguly. And the title of her webinar is To Be or Not To Be? Can you truly run a mission-driven business at the intersection of profit and purpose? Uh, Sambriti is uh, Arabella's advisor's uh, chief executive officer. Arabella is a philanthropy managed services firm. She oversees all aspects of the firm performance, including revenue operations, strategic growth, marketing, and client service. She spends each day guiding Arabella to deliver on its mission to help foundations, philanthropists, and investors who are serious about impact achieve the greatest good with their resources. She joined Arabella at 14 years ago, after 14 years at uh, CEB, Corporate Executive Board, uh, as Executive Director of CEB's Legal Risk Compliance Practice. CEB now is part of the Gartner Group. She managed the firm's subscription-based research program for internal auditors, general counsel, chief risk officers, and chief compliance officers. Uh, she launched the company government practice, launching uh, launched several uh, finance programs designed to help augment con controls and government best practices. Earlier in her career, she worked for JP Morgan, Chase, Emerging Market Research Division in Singapore, and as a consultant in the World Bank for East Asia Environment and Social Development Unit. She has an MBA from Wharton. Today, over 3,000, four, four, almost 4,000 companies are certified B corporations that meets the highest standard of purpose. These companies are required to consider the impact of their decisions on their workers, customers, suppliers, community, and the environment and develop policies accordingly. But it's not always easy to manage profit and purpose. And as with most organizations, navigating trade-offs are challenging. So I'm pretty well enlighten us discuss about the B Corp movement, where it's heading, and what it takes to manage a purpose-driven business. Without much ado, Sampriti, thank you for, for being with us. The floor is yours, my dear. Thank you so much, Professor, and thanks everyone for joining us today. It is a great pleasure to be here. I'm absolutely honored. Um, and let me maybe start a little bit uh, by telling you about, as, as Professor said, what it is that a B Corps is and what it is that they actually um, are designed to do. So I'll start my comments um, and I'll keep them brief, uh, but basically I just wanted to share sort of why B Corps exist at all. And the reason is quite simple. Um, it's that the belief that society's most challenging problems cannot be solved by government and nonprofits alone. The B Corps community essentially works towards reducing inequality, lowering levels of poverty, um, creating a healthier environment, stronger communities, and the creation of high quality jobs with dignity and purpose. By harnessing the power of business and the best that business can be, B Corps use both profit and growth as a means to a greater end, positive impact uh, in our communities. and in the environment. Um, certified B Corporations, which is what Arabella Advisors is, meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and, and purpose. Um, and what, at its core, what we are trying to do is to create sort of a cultural shift to redefine su success in business and build a more inclusive and sustainable economy. Um, there is a declaration of interdependence, not declaration of independence, but a declaration of interdependence that we take as B Corps corporations. And in essence, it's um, kind of fourfold. The first is that we must be the change we seek in the world. 
that all business should be conducted as if people and place mattered. Third, that through our products and practices and profits, businesses should aspire to do no harm and benefit all. And then fourth, in order to do so requires that we act with the understanding that we are each dependent on one another and thus responsible for each other and future generations. And in a lot of ways, that seems like an obvious statement, but to take that sort of promise as a business reorients how you think about what your company does, who it does those things for, and what its broader mission is. As the professor uh, said, there are about 3,979, so close to 4,000 B Corps. We exist in over 75, uh, 74 countries and across 150 industries. And this is a movement that's really taken off quite rapidly. Arabella Advisors has been a B Corps for almost a decade. And we were one of the first 100 companies uh, uh, to become a certified B Corps, just to give you a sense of the scale and magnitude of the broader B Corps movement. So how in fact does a company become a B Corps? Well, um, there is an assessment, it's called the B Impact Assessment, which is very rigorous and it takes into account or uh, it allows us and asks us to consider four core areas. And you see those outlined on this page. What is the governance of the organization? How do we treat our workers? What is our interaction with and commitment to our community? Um, what is our impact on the environment and how do we take environmental considerations into account in our production and distribution? And then lastly, what is our relationship with our customers? So these are sort of the five different dimensions of B cores. And as a practical matter, uh, we actually uh, take an impact assessment, uh, 150 different business practices are evaluated. And each of these is looking at sort of good, better, or best business practice. Once we submit the B assessment, it is independently verified by a third party called B Lab. And once we become certified, um, our scores are publicly available uh, to anyone, including you all, if you would like to take a look. So the combination of self-certification of a third party validation of public transparency and legal accountability all help the certified B Corps build trust and value and, um, and create a different standard for what businesses are responsible for. I'll go into this in a little bit more detail just to maybe uh, uh, give you a, a sense of what these things look like. I outlined the five different dimensions of certification, but just to sort of break it down a little bit further, for example, if we were just to look at the top left at workers, we as B Corps get asked uh, very specific questions. For example, what percentage of our company is owned by actual employees? Do we allow for uh, uh, job flexibility? What kind of uh, compensation structure do we have? How much does the CEO get paid relative to the uh, uh, most junior person in the organization? How many hours do we dedicate to training? What is the broader benefit package that we provide? These are very, very detailed question, all uh, designed around uh, participation, around voice, around engagement and um, with the premise that employees must also have a say in the business that they are actually running. Across all of these dimensions, we try to become uh, uh, a transparent, but also understand what it takes to become a better B Corps. I'll take a moment and just highlight um, that for any company to be a qualifying B Corps, uh, you need to score an 80 on this particular assessment. Um, and you can see on this page, there's sort of good, great, outstanding, and extraordinary. Companies that fall in the extraordinary bucket uh, are scoring somewhere between 160 
and uh, 200 on their B core assessments. Um, just again, in the interest of transparency, I wanted to show you uh, Arabella's uh, B impact uh, score and we're at a 95.8. So we're in the sort of great category, but not in the outstanding category. And so the question is why? Why is it that we are satisfied with this particular score and how is it that we might do better? I'll go back um, to what I showed before. One of the reasons that Arabella Advisors does not score very high in, um, in, the, in our B Corps assessment is here in this bucket called environment. Um, and it's not to say that we don't care about the environment, but we're a services company. We're providing consulting services. We don't really have sort of a physical plant. We don't have a supply chain. Uh, we don't create products uh, and therefore we have actually don't reach um, all of these different standards for the environment. This particular section of the B Corps assessment was really designed for product companies um, and really oriented towards sort of uh, a sustainable supply chain. So it's not so much that we don't do well in this area in as much as we are a services company that um, can't necessarily take advantage of some of these particular questions. And I might say that's one of the downsides of the certification process. When you try to take 150 different industries and come up with a single standard, it becomes hard to generalize across all of those areas. So certain businesses do very well in, um, in uh, core areas of the B Core and others do better. I think there's also a philosophical question is, what does getting better actually get you? That is to say, if you spend a lot of time and money to go from great to extraordinary, does it in fact make that much of a difference? And I think it remains to be seen um, what the cost benefit is in that type of improvement. At least from our business, we have found that um, there is not a lot of benefit in going from great to extraordinary. And the re-engineering of our business processes or the change that we would have to enact may not be something that our clients or customers would necessarily be willing to pay for. And I can come back and, and answer that further uh, at the Q&A if you all would like. It's a good chance for me to actually step back and say, well, why is Arabella Advisors a B Corps? And what, it is, what is it that we uh, actually do? A uh, professor was kind enough to talk a little bit about our company. Uh, essentially, we're a philanthropy consulting firm. We help donors give their money away. And that may sound uh, like, uh, I remember when I first heard about the company, I said, is that actually a job? I can't imagine that it's that hard to give money away. It sounds like a pretty good, uh, uh, good gig. Um, well, it turns out it's actually more challenging at times to give money away than people would think. Uh, first, there's a lot of regulatory compliance that actually comes with defining what is and isn't charitable. I'll give you an example. Here uh, in the United States, as well as elsewhere in the world, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin and others have taken off and really gained prominence. Well, cryptocurrency is hard to verify and it's not always accepted as legal tender in a banking institution. So if you want to give Bitcoin away charitably, there's actually a lot of hurdles that you have to go through. And in fact, certain um, nonprofits are not able to accept that. So that's just an example of why logistically it can be a little bit challenging uh, or not as easy as one would think to give money away. Another reason, and this is less uh, sort of mechanical and more, if you will, philosophical, which is it's really hard for individuals to decide what causes they care about and whether or not their dollars are actually making an impact. And so that's why they turn to philanthropy advisors like Arabella. Uh, over the last 15 years, uh, our, our company was started in 2005. Uh, over the last 15 years, we've helped to advise on over $5 billion in philanthropic assets. 
We currently employ about 300 staff uh, in eight different um, cities here in the United States. And we have served or serviced about 400 different uh, uh, clients. They're usually uh, donors uh, who are thinking about impact investing. They are donors who are foundations trying to give their money away. Um, and that is our, our basic area of focus. Um, since I joined as the CEO uh, six years ago, I was employee 99. Uh, we just cost 300 uh, people. So I've been able to uh, sit on top of the organization while we've hired 200 people. And that gives me great pride. And it is another dimension of being a B Corps, which is creating jobs in our communities, uh, creating jobs with dignity, uh, providing for health care, uh, particularly in the midst of a global pandemic for individuals and their families. Those are all aspects of what we do and our commitment to be uh, an ethical organization of the highest standard. On the bottom, you can see some of the awards that we have received as recognition for the meaningful work that we do. At our core, because our work is about helping philanthropic assets move into charity, that is what essentially enables us to become or qualify for a B Corps, our core service. Uh, uh, the benefit that we provide is advancing a charitable cause. And that's the essence of which why, uh, the reason why we became a B Corps. Um, on this page, you can see some other companies, maybe some brands that you've heard of, including Patagonia, uh, as well as Ben and Jerry's, uh, Danone, North America, which is actually a quite a large organization. It took them, uh, I believe, four years to get their B Corps certification. And what you'll recognize here is most of these uh, companies, or many of them, are product companies. They, uh, they make actual products that you uh, and others could purchase. And it is the case that today, many uh, individuals, many consumers, particularly millennial consumers, particularly women consumers, are making ethical choices or conscious choices about the brands that they support, uh, both through uh, their purchases, but also through who they follow, who their influencers are. And so for all of these reasons, there is very strong alignment for a lot of these companies between their brand and ultimately their consumers as well. For us, our thinking is similar, um, although a little bit different. Um, why are we a B Corps? Well, it influences how our business is actually structured. And one of the things that we are very committed to, even though we are a privately held business, is transparency. Uh, and so we share our financial information, um, some of our challenges, some of our competitive landscape. Uh, uh, many of the decisions that I make on a day-to-day -day basis as a CEO, we share across all 300 people at Arabella Advisors uh, just so people know the business that they actually work for and so they can feel a commitment to that. The second reason we're a B Corps is it actually gives us a, a path, if you will, a playbook for what type of business practices we want to employ. Um, everything from how we treat our employees, how we structure our benefits plan, where and how we locate our offices, how close they are to public transportation, for example, all of those are driven by our B Corps assessment. Um, for us, it's a way to communicate our values to our clients and partners. It is an authentic commitment to our responsible business practice. It automatically or it is often an imprimatur of uh, uh, your overall values. And then I would say one other reason that we think very strategically about being a B Corps is it actually allows us to attract and retain talent. Many of the individuals that come to work at Arabella Advisors could work for a regular corporation. They could also work in the nonprofit sector. Instead, they are curious about and choose to work at a business that is at the intersection of profit and purpose. And it goes without saying, but it is the right thing for our people and our planet to make sure that businesses are socially conscious. I'll end maybe on one additional note, and um, it's, it's a broader perspective, so I'll step back for a moment. Um, my view and that of many business leaders is if one does not embrace being a B Corps, they risk 
um, they risk what the future actually holds. And I'll just use one example to maybe share how that happened. Um, some of you may be familiar with the global divestment uh, movement, uh, the divestment from fossil fuels. Since it's, it's launched by students as a moral call to climate action back in 2011, the fossil fuel divestment campaign has become a mainstream financial movement that has mobilized trillions of dollars in support of clean energy transition. So on the top left, uh, you can see uh, this is a sort of year by year uh, 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 diagram or graph of the divestment movement. And today, nearly a thousand institutional investors with six $0.25 trillion in assets have committed to divest from fossil fuels. That's up from $52 billion, billion with a B, four years ago. That's an astonishing increase of 12,000%, much of it driven by the climate movement. On the uh, right side of this page, I'm showing even just from this past week, a couple of examples. You may have heard that ExxonMobil, uh, two board members were ousted in favor of uh, a more clean energy focused uh, board. And then likewise in the Netherlands, Royal Dutch Shell was ordered by a court uh, uh, to cut its emissions significantly. That will probably be challenged. Nonetheless, it is all indicative of the energy behind the divestment movement and how powerful, significant, and, um, uh, and if you will, consequential it's been in a very short period of time. Today, mission-driven institutions are divesting in very large numbers, um, and you see new commitments from the health, faith, philanthropic, and university sectors. Doctors are concerned about the public health impacts of climates, and faith-based organizations are divesting in much higher numbers. I think it's fair to say that there's an ethical case for divestment, um, uh, largely driven by youth activists who are um, making sure that we think about the urgency of the climate crisis. In addition, there is now increasingly a very strong financial case for divestment from fossil fuels. Um, and uh, we know that now investors can divest without jeopardizing their risk return profile. In addition, there's a lot of clean energy alternatives that are providing uh, uh, great financial and social returns for investors. And lastly, um, what I would say is that there is um, a, a series of tactics, including litigation, uh, putting support on institutional investors that is being uh, embraced across the board. And now there's a fiduciary responsibility for divestment. So within a short period, less than a decade, the level of activism has become so concentrated that it's very hard for companies to ignore uh, the, the moral imperative behind divestment, uh, uh, which is essentially the urgency of climate change. Um, I show on the bottom right of this graphic uh, just another example of divestment. In this case, it's for private prisons here in the United States, uh, a lot of banks have funded private prisons, which disproportionately um, uh, incarcerate uh, people of color in our communities. Uh, and so over the last three years, uh, really spurred by the uh, separation of children from their parents at the border, there was a lot of pressure on banks to actually begin to divest from private prisons. And this type of pressure collectively is what is um, uh, raising awareness in the financial services industry around um, the power of business and purpose. I'll close by maybe just reading one comment from Larry Fink, who uh, you all may know is the CEO of BlackRock, the largest institutional uh, investor. And um, he, two years ago, came up with a statement uh, and, and he wrote a letter to all of his shareholders. And he basically said, profits are in no way inconsistent with purpose. In fact, profits and purpose are inextricably linked. Profits are essential if a company is to effectively serve all of its stakeholder over time, not only shareholders, but also employees, customers, and communities. And similarly, when a company truly understands and expresses its purpose, it functions with the focus and strategic discipline that drive long-term profitability. Purpose unifies management, employees, and communities. It drives ethical behavior and creates an essential check on the actions that go against the best interest of stakeholders. Purpose drives culture. 
provides a framework for consistent decision making and ultimately helps sustain long term financial returns for the shareholder of your companies. And I'd like to I'd like to close out with that statement. Um, because I think there's a belief, especially uh, for 40 years that has been taught at business school, that essentially say the pursuit of profits is the be all and end all for shareholders. And I think what Larry Fink is sharing, and we have ourselves discovered, is a company that is mission driven, that is focused on sort of long term uh, results, one that cares deeply about its employees will become a successful company and with focus will actually become profitable over time. The notion that these are intention, I would argue, is a false construct. And in fact, purpose driven companies will become the most profitable in large part because they will be driving their own agenda instead of feeling this pressure from many other outside stakeholders. So with that, let me close my sort of formal remarks, Professor, and maybe turn the floor over to you and any students who may have any questions. Uh, thank you, Sampriti. Uh, some of our audience are actually not students. Uh, but anyway, uh, let me I'll start by asking you a simple question. I mean, I, I'm thinking about the example you gave of Exxon and Shell, for example. I mean, for me, imagine if those guys try to be a B Corp, they'll have to divest completely out of their business. As simple as that, people working on a tobacco company. I mean, we can sort of tolerate them doing a CSR, but they, will, they cannot. Fit. And I'm comparing them actually with a company like Arabella where you're actually uh, advising philanthropy. I mean, in your case, telling philanthropists to not invest and in do harm, try to invest and do good, should be an easier job, right? It's a good question, Professor, and I think you're right. I, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to make the point that the business we're in, if you will, automatically gives us a platform uh, uh, to become a B Corp. Nonetheless, I would argue that there are very good business practices embodied in the community or the worker aspects of being a B Corps that many organizations can choose to take advantage of, and I would argue should take advantage of. It's hard to maybe meet all of the different criteria, but certainly in terms of workers and in terms of governance, governance and transparency, there's much that can be done. I also just wanted to clarify, it is very hard, if you will, to go back to become a company to reverse all of these practices. And we've watched with multinationals in particular, it's very challenging to uh, globally take on the B Corps status. In fact, what companies decide to do, multinational companies, is they do it one business unit at a time or potentially one geography at a time. And that provides, if you will, a natural experimentation um, to do some A to B testing to say, is this in fact, a better place for us to be. But your point is well taken. Generally, if people come to me, I would say start your company as a B Corps. Um, it is much harder to reverse engineer into that than it is to actually begin with that in mind. Okay. Now, follow up question again on one of the companies you put, Danone, for example. Now, Danone is very interesting because they were very much pioneered pioneers in terms of uh, multi-stakeholder models of business, they actually have a purpose taken into their own legal status. Now, the interesting part, when you look historically, they, they started the work with uh, their, their CEO, uh, Ribaud, and then the recent one was actually Emmanuel Faber. Now, Emmanuel Faber was actually ousted uh, as the CEO and the, the, the chairman of the company. And the reason stated was really a chronic underperformance compared to Nestle. Now, the interesting thing also is that when he was ousted, their share prices rose. And lots of people tell you this is really a concept of venture uh, financiers or aggressive financiers or just seeking profit at any, any cost. I just wanted to get your point of view about this. 
we could argue, I mean, to start with, that just the design of having a one person who is the CEO and the chairman at the same time is bad governance to start with. Uh, so excuse me, I mean, even if the spouse of doing environmental and social, they have a bad governance in, ingrained in the way they're operating. The other thing I want you to sort of re relate to this is about the whole ecosystem. We talk about an ecosystem, we talk about governance. We talk about corporation, I mean, uh, governments or civil society or even community trying to curtail a little bit of influence of really aggressive financiers. So I just want to hear your, your point of views about this. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, uh, speaking uh, specifically around Denon, um, now remember, I said that profits and purpose need to be in um, concert with one another. Uh, and in the case of Denon, uh, according to the board, the CEO was not delivering on the kind of performance that they were looking for. And I think this is one of the sort of dangers or perils of being a B Corps. There is a notional belief that the mission-driven nature of the organization will enhance the brand, will draw in new customers and clients, and therefore shore up your revenues and, and profits. And in this particular case, that, that did not, um, uh, at least from the perspective of the board, did not transpire. Nonetheless, uh, I think that what Denon has been able to do in terms of re-engineering their processes, especially in their supply chain to achieve the B Corps outcome to the degree that that's driving efficiency and greater uh, talent outcomes, we, I think we need to see what the longer term impact is for, for Danone. I, that, that's kind of one point. The second point around the ecosystem, I think uh, my bigger question and, I, and something I wonder about is how will institutional investors balance the pressure to be better fiduciaries, namely stewards of good governance and the environment, while also balancing, in many cases, short-term returns and their profits, uh, particularly with so many institutional investors that now are invested in private equity and other alternative assets, that long-term return is really at um, up for debate and up for question. And I think that's the basic tension that I see in the B Corps community is, in essence, what the B Corps community is saying is build a business for the long run and good things will happen. But not all institutional investors have a long run horizon. And that's when I think CEOs and or institutional investors and their shareholders have real tension is understanding what that time horizon is. In full disclosure, as I mentioned to everyone on the call, Arabella Advisors is a privately held company. We are not publicly traded. And so as a CEO, my board does not ask me to think about performance this quarter, performance for the end of the year. Their charge is essentially how to build a long, long-term business. And if you're doing that, there are quarters or there are years where you're making investments that are quite significant. Sometimes your profits dip up and down. Nonetheless, over the long run, that sort of pays off. And that is where I think the biggest tension is between what the power of the B Corps movement is and how it, if you will, interacts with publicly traded markets that have, by definition, much shorter time horizons. Okay, I'm going to start taking uh questions from the audience. Uh, there is a question from Vineet Sharma. Uh, please unmute yourself, please, Vineet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I have a question regarding uh, uh, this thing regarding the BCO model, you know, regarding it basically because, you know, th that it is considered that, you know, the business models, financial models are basically a lot more complex, you know, supply, with supply chains, you know, they are not favoring, you know, what you call uh, uh, one size fits all, you know, strategy. So what really happens is that, you know, that uh, uh, I mean, uh, on the surface, you know, some of these, uh, I mean, uh, uh, firms basically have very good business model, but in, in the, for example, the financial companies or etc, you know, but, but uh, underlying risks are there 
there for example they they might be um, uh, uh, i mean lending to uh, somewhat you know uh, i mean fossil fuel companies or uh, 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 i mean lot lot of uh, carbon emitting companies etc so how do you i mean uh, keep, keep that thing into i mean uh, keep that thing into account you know because uh, i mean uh, for example you know uh, these days i mean uh, because of complex uh, business models you know the lot of uh, firms are geographically very very much uh, located in very uh, wide uh, geographies and a lot of these risk uh, for example you know, uh, uh, practices are basically uh, diverted towards uh, you know some of the developing countries as a trend uh, best example is the exxon mobil and uh, sell uh, some uh, sell uh, 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 some of these big co- big corporates are there which uh, uh, you were uh, mentioning and uh, uh, same is the case with the financial co- uh, firms etc you know hedge funds etc they lend to a lot more uh, carbon emitting technology even the bitcoin uses a lot a lot more uh, uh, you know this uh, you know mining and uh, i mean uh, energy uh, energy etc so how do you i mean uh, take that in- thing into account Yeah, thank you, Vinit. It's a very good question. And what I would say is historically, I mentioned typically companies have now started, they've started their enterprise with the purpose of being a B Corps. And for the most part, most B Corps, other than those big brands that I showed you, are actually quite small. Um, Arabella Advisors, even in the services business, is one of the larger B Corps. And in the greater scheme of things, we're quite small. And one of the reasons, Vineet, as you mentioned, is it is very hard for large companies who, for example, have uh, invested in fossil fuels, or maybe they are carbon emitting, maybe they are in the sort of strip mining business. Um, those would never qualify to become B Corps, just as, as uh, Professor had, had uh, mentioned. There is an entire universe of companies that um, either cannot qualify or they don't track their all of their footprint, their environmental footprint, or uh, they don't actually measure or track any of these things, making it much harder to be a B Corps. Nonetheless, and I continue to maintain this, is even if a company can be, let's say, a uh, carbon emitting or perhaps invested in, uh, here in the United States, many companies are invested in guns, uh, for example, the gun uh, industry. Even if that is the case, there are still elements of good governance. There are still elements of community engagement, charity and charitable giving is one of those that can be implemented. And these are all traded off with one another. And that maybe is one of the things I didn't address directly in my talk, but I wanted to share with you is there is a tension at times with B Corp. For example, we could take all of our excess profits and reinvest them into salaries for our staff or reinvest them into the uh, uh, most energy efficient buildings that we could locate our offices in. We could decide to change our corporate structure and instead of being uh, closely held, we could decide that it can become an employee owned company. There are all these conscious choices that one can make in order to get a better B Corp certification or to meet some of these criteria, but then you're trading off Uh, perhaps, again, maybe profits, perhaps you're trading off engagement, perhaps you're trading off uh, uh, different aspects. And so as a B Corps leader, one of the things that you need to decide is what are the elements that are going to be most important for you, for your employees, for your clients, And again, not just being driven by what's right, but where's the ROI? Where is the return on investment on becoming a B Corps and or some of these business practices? And for any business, there is a trade-off in terms of what, what to do that. And part of that is driven also by the life cycle of a company. Are you an early stage business? Are you a mid-stage business? Or perhaps you've been a, a business for a long time. All of these factor in to whether or not to advance some of these better business practices. Thank you for your question. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry, I always do that. I'm, I was muted. Uh, I'm going to ask you a, a few questions until we get uh, people, I mean, uh, participants uh, to, to sort of. When you look at B Corp, Uh, the profile of a company, do they have a specific 
ownership style, for example. I'll give you an example. When you talk, for example, as Patagonia or Ben and Jerry, for example, it is clear there is uh, somebody who founded the company who had a, a great vision in terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, social, environmental, etc. And the company, when they grow naturally because of his influence, because of the momentum, it actually attracted mind-like investors. I could argue Patagonia is the same thing. My guess, Arabella is, is, is the same thing. Uh, yeah, it's a it, it's an excellent question. So I think there's two points of commonality. One is, as you noted, it they tend to be founder driven, um, and it's because founders, uh, you know, they are the they are the heart and the soul of a business, um, and they usually are sort of executives that that run a business in a very particular style and way. And often he or she will be that, that moral conscience of the business. They'll make sacrifices in order to live by those values. And those values then become defining to the organization. That's very different than a company where you have professional management. Though that professional management operates by, I would say, a very standard business playbook that doesn't always put sort of the moral compass at its core. Um, I, I don't know what it's like at the American University, but I'll just share when I went to Wharton Business School 25 years ago, ethics was a, uh, a, a class we took for three weeks out of a two year curriculum versus corporate finance, which was essentially every week for two years. When that becomes the signal um, that you receive early in your education, and that's reinforced uh, in businesses that you live in, it's very clear that you know profit and growth are the primary drivers. So I do think founder-owned businesses, those where a founder believes that uh, his or her products or her services should be different, really are very core to the B Corps uh, community. The second, and it's related to the first, is often companies that are employee owned, that have a significant portion of employee ownership uh, are also often B Corps. And there again, that is the belief that each individual has a right to uh, the return on their labor, not just measured by their salary, but also measured by employee ownership. So those I would say are fairly common structures. And then the third uh, I alluded to are privately held businesses uh, as opposed to publicly traded business. And, and that's because privately held businesses often have a longer time horizon for maturation than, uh, than publicly traded firms that have very um, clear quarterly targets that they need to meet in capital markets. I, I will also, yeah, sorry, one other thing uh, uh, that I'd like to clarify is there are, um, part of being a B Corp is to have a balance sheet that doesn't have a lot of leverage um, on it. So there are other dimensions of the financial aspects of how you run your business that require greater financial sustainability. And that can sometimes inhibit companies that require a tremendous amount uh, that are very capital intensive and require a lot of uh, debt financing. Sometimes that can also be a bit of a delimiter to becoming a B Corp. Great. Uh I have a question from Tiffany. B. Tiffany, would you please unmute yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm calling in from New York. Oh. Uh, so this is a question that may be more American, but may have uh, similar parallels in other countries and markets. Why would you choose a B Corp status versus other options like a minority owned business or women owned business certification, which is an option that you would have in the States, especially as a founder? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I am not the founder uh, uh, of the business. Otherwise, uh, I would do that. I was hired uh, as a CEO. And likewise, um, our capitalization um, does not qualify for minority owned. I am not a majority shareholder in the business. Um, so, so that's a very practical reason. But your question is well taken, uh, uh, Tiffany. And what I would say is, if a woman founds uh, a business or someone who is uh, a minority here in the United States, you, have, you can get uh, preferential status. And what I would say is you can do all three. You can be a woman minority owned B Corps. And as a result, you would get all of those certifications um, uh, if one wanted to. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, um, one of the things I should share is A, it's pretty time intensive to get all of these certifications. And in the B case of B Corps, that impact assessment's pretty expensive. I think it costs us 30,000 US dollars a year. It's not, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's fairly significant. It takes us about, I'd say uh, uh, two or three people on our staff about four weeks at least to collect all of the data and information that is necessary. <clears throat> so it's not, um, it's not insignificant. Therefore, you have to really believe in what it is that you're doing, or you have to believe that that certification process is going to get you the kind of talent and client um, uh, outcomes. Um, it's not just about doing the right thing. There has to be some other business dimensions to it. But yeah, it's a good question, Tiffany. If I ever, um, whenever I come up with that genius idea of, you know, a groundbreaking business, I will definitely think about that uh, women and minority owned business structure. Uh, I'm almost 50. So I'm running out of time a little bit with coming out of uh, other ideas, but it's, uh, it's been fun to run someone else's business as well. I have a question from Dr. Neja Matu. Uh, I, I know she's she's uh, stationed in India and it's probably too late at night, but she actually wrote it in uh, in a comment. And I'll I'll uh, I'll say it for her benefit, and she'll probably hear the recording later on. How to maintain the balance between the profit and the purpose of the business and be sustainable? That's again the same question. Can you be both? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, again, my, my answer will keep coming back to time horizon and um, that uh, it is so hard, I think in today's world to think about building a business that endures, that lasts for a long time. Um, and the reason is because capital markets, uh, you know, will severely punish companies as, as sort of, uh, you know, markets change and privately held businesses increasingly are um, approached by private equity investors who also have a very short horizon. So part of the sustainability question as a CEO or as a management team is to say, do we want to build a business that lasts forever? Do we wanna build a business that lasts for the next uh, 10 years? Do we wanna build a business that lasts for the next five years? What is our time horizon? And I have always believed um, at Arabella Advisors or anywhere else, my belief is for Arabella Advisors, the field of philanthropy is growing in scale, scope, and magnitude. If you read about a Bill Gates or a Jeff Bezos or anyone uh, of, of that nature or stature here in the United States, sadly, unfortunately, and shockingly, during this global pandemic, where we've had this enormous dislocation of so many communities and individuals, um, the wealthiest philanthropists have only gotten more wealthy. Uh, and so my mission is that these individuals not only have a desire, but at times an obligation to sort of think about their wealth and their giving. And that's one of the reasons what we exist. And as far as I'm concerned, Arabella Advisors will be here for as long as needed to help think about how to address inequality in our society, not just in the United States, but globally. And therefore my horizon, my time horizon is long. That allows us to build a more sustainable business. It means that we have um, uh, three to five year time horizons by which we try to achieve a certain set of objectives. We can't do everything at once. 
We can't, um, you know, increase salaries significantly. We can't necessarily move into the nicest uh, buildings, uh, even if we'd like to. And those are some of the conscious choices we make about our investments that allow for that level of sustainability. So my, my, I guess my sh short answer is make sure that you have a lo long time horizon and you know what your time horizon is and be conscious about the investments that you're making. Perhaps really figuring out what your nice to have versus your need to have dimensions are. And then the last thing I might share, and this is always a hard one, but for any of you who are leaders in business or thinking about a, sort of being a leader in business is um, you take advice but you don't allow sort of sentiment of a popular sentiment to drive your decision making. And so I think it's always really important to uh, take in lots of different perspectives, but make sure that you have a point of view as to what that long term sustainable path is. For me, that is driven by what I think the sustainable growth rate of our business is, somewhere around 10 to 15% per year. And likewise, what I think a healthy profit is for our business. It fluctuates anywhere between 12 and 18%. Sometimes it's a little bit less, sometimes it's a little bit more, but that provides kind of clarity and transparency around the definition of sustainability, at least from a financial perspective. The B Corps itself defines a definition of sustainability from a business practice perspective, and it's the combination of those two that become a little bit of a driving force for us. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Jonathan. Uh, Brock, Jonathan, please, please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim Pretty. Um, looking at the number of B Corp organizations uh, from your presentation, and that makes me think about membership organizations in the United States or trade associations where there are entities with similar standards, uh, process and procedures, and just similar organizations that interact with each other to um, understand um, ongoing trends or what their uh, sectors are dealing with. Do B Corp leaders mm -hmm. ever interact with each other to talk about process improvements or ways that they can improve upon their status or uh, understand what's changing in the sectors? Yeah, thank you for that question, Jonathan. So Jonathan was saying, you know, there are um, other certifications. T Tiffany mentioned that as well. There are things like fair trade or organic. There's LEED certification, which is a sort of a building uh, certification and standard. And for the most part, these are industry specific. B Corp works across industries. And as such, as I mentioned, there's in some ways limited applicability, but on the other hand, a much greater sort of movement building. And so the B Corp community does get together on a fairly regular basis to define um, and improve upon our standards also to benchmark best practices. And lastly, I should have mentioned this, but B Corps tend to um, buy from one another and also uh, sell to one another. So that is to say, for example, at Arabella Advisors, we hire B Corps caterers when we do any particular event. We have a B Corps provider that uh, provides our accounting services. And so we really try to consciously support what we call the B economy. Every year there is a national conference uh, that, that one can attend. And that is the forum by which many B Corps leaders will get together and share our ideas and, uh, and benchmark one of these best practices with one another. One other thing that I will share is increasingly, and this is where I think um, things can get a little bit tricky, but increasingly the B Corps community is, uh, is making sort of uh, decisions to get involved with legislation so actually advocating on behalf of specific causes. This past uh, summer here in the United States, in 2020, the B Corps movement made a very strong statement in uh, to become an anti-racist organization. Similarly, they are trying to make sure legislatively that, uh, uh, for example, um, they are trying to come out with positions in specific issues to bring together the B Corps movement. I, I started by saying it can be a little bit tricky uh, because I think each organization needs to decide for themselves 
whether or not those broader values are consistent, not just with B Corp, but with uh, uh, their own uh, company's sort of position. And that can take a little bit of time. So it takes some time to build consensus around this. Nonetheless, this community of 4,000 organizations are beginning to do that. One other thing that I'll just note, Jonathan, since you raised it, is um, there is some desire perhaps to think about the, uh, if you will, the dominant role that the United States has played in the B Corps movement um, and potentially to think about a, a US B Corps and a global B Corps, recognizing that business practices, cultural norms, um, and perhaps uh, the relationship between the employer and employee looks very different in the United States, uh, which is a less labor friendly environment than elsewhere. Uh, and so there is some talk of whether or not the B Corps movement has gotten so large that you need a sort of US versus uh, the rest of the world kind of standard, not because the US is unique, but frankly, because the US tends to dominate. Uh, and so there is some recognition that it is very important for the global B Corps movement to lift up the voices of other nations uh, and other cultures as well. Thanks, Jonathan, for that question. Okay. I wanna sort of uh, uh, end with an, a comment, a note, and maybe a question to you also. When the first slide you had, you showed examples of trends that for me really just shows stakeholders' power being exerted to force companies to act well or to behave. Uh, current, I mean, I, I think it's uh, one of the trendsetters is the WEF, whether you're and now everybody's talking about stakeholders' capitalism, which is, I mean, the concept of stakeholders is a concept that has been around for 20 years and it was coined by Ed Freeman of Darden, Darden School. Again, it takes you back again to the concept of governance, the concept of checks and bounds, wow. the concept of I as a society. And of course, the government has to play with this. We have to put clear boundaries or clear incentives or sometimes even clear punishment on companies that do not behave well. Now, I, the B Corporation is brilliant, of course, and I have, I, I, I really like it. But I think it, for it to become more of really uh, it, 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 a grand movement that's going to cause a seismic change, it really has to be complemented by ecosystem uh, governance or I, stakeholders' I power. I agree with that. And I, I think that that's fair. I mean, there's only so much that sort of individual companies and companies collectively can do. I think we believe we're a movement because we're um, leaders who, uh, I wouldn't say we're singular in our thought, but we have this strong belief that business is a, is a force for good. But I agree with you, there are other ecosystem actors that need to act in concert. And one of the most important ones, I would say, are regulators, uh, as well as institutional investors who essentially are market movers. Each of us individually don't move markets, but the broader ecosystem is necessary. And I, I continue to watch institutional investors, um, uh, oftentimes regulated by entities who are not yet, uh, if you will, convinced that, uh, that uh, broader societal outcomes are necessarily the place and purpose for businesses. Um, and so in addition to watching the B Corps movement, I think it's more important to see what kind of regulatory public policy changes might we see um, globally that help to move this forward. And here I would argue the Europeans have really been leaders uh, in, in helping drive business outcomes. Uh, in the United States, historically, there is not as much energy around heavily regulated um, uh, markets. Uh, that's generally seen as uh, countercultural and, and not very much in the belief of the capitalist system. But in the wake of this um, sort of seismic pandemic that we have seen, one that has exposed the gaps between those that are the most vulnerable and those that are the most protected, I see more energy 
to have a heavier hand develop and strengthen the ecosystem that is necessary for uh, ultimate success of broader societal outcomes. Companies are certainly one part of it, but they need supporting dimensions as well, as you rightly noted. And that is everything from governance, how are we sort of established, to assessment, how are we measured in terms of our performance, and maybe closing out on my note, most importantly, training. How are we building that next generation of leaders at your institution as well as in other places? How do we imbue this belief that profit and purpose are, are in fact compatible beginning with leaders at business schools such that tomorrow's leaders and the leaders two generations from now enter the workforce with that belief, with that knowledge and collectively help us all achieve those social and environmental outcomes while also building healthy businesses. Uh, Sampriti, I cannot thank you enough. And I, I really, again, I, uh, I know you're joining us in, in, uh, in Memorial Day, which is a holiday in the US. And I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate the guys also participants from the US. Uh, happy Memorial Day. And thank you for, for, for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for joining. Um, if, you, uh, if there are any questions that you have or you'd like to learn more, please don't hesitate to reach out to me via LinkedIn. I'll share a copy of this presentation as well. It was my great honor to join you and I look forward to the sort of sustained conversation, live, virtual, and in all other forums. Take care, Thank have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you all for participating in this webinar and we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday, June 2nd. Uh, and on June 2nd, we're going to have uh, Margot Brandenberg. She's a senior program officer at the Ford Foundation Mission Investment Team. She's going to talk about impact investment and inclusive capital market. She used to work, by the way, in the Rockefeller Foundation, and she was very much a leader in uh, the impact investing initiative that the Rockefeller Foundation started. She co-authored the book, The Power of Impact Investment, with former Rockefeller Foundation President Rudin. So I really in, uh, invite you to join us on Wednesday. Again, thank you, and see, see you in, in, in future events, inshallah.